Hi, and welcome to today's session on tech supports for middle school students who've been identified as twice exceptional. My name is Dusty Columbia Emberry, and I'm a former classroom teacher certified in special education and gifted and talented education. I'm a current faculty member at Wright State University. My colleagues, Laura Clark and Michael Emberry, both are working in the schools, and so they're not able to be here today. Uh, but Laura Clark is a, an educational consultant, and Michael Emberry is a classroom teacher. Um, he has worked for the last four years at a school for the creative and performing arts, where all students have been identified as having gifts and talents, and his particular caseload also consisted of students also identified as having a disability, so twice exceptional. So today, what we are going to talk about are some supports that we can use for these students. So our learning targets, first we're going to define 2E, we're going to look specifically at some learner characteristics, and then focus on strengths and needs and talk about some strategies. I also want to point out some state and federal resources and a plan for development that you can use in your district or your school uh, with your students for an action plan. So what do we mean by twice exceptional? So first of all, we're talking about students who have been identified with a disability under IDEA, and they've also been identified as having gifts and talents in a particular area. And what we want to do is really focus on having their strengths and their needs balance. So I do want to make some clarifying language. Of course, we want to always use person first or people first language. We use this a lot in special education, but it doesn't always translate to other areas. That is, we know that children are more than their deficits, but we also know that they're more than their strengths. We don't want to create undue pressure or stress on children with gifts and talents that they have to meet some expectation um, for, for the adults around them. So, so for instance, we want to say a student who's been identified as gifted in this area rather than a gifted student. A student who has a disability in this area, like learning disabilities, rather than calling them a gifted disabled student. We do use that label twice exceptional, so we can say students who've been identified as twice exceptional. That way we're not labeling by their specific deficits or strengths. So there's four key elements that need to be present when we're talking about working with students who've been identified as twice exceptional. First of all, there's a continuum of service delivery options that range from general education classrooms all the way to self-contained classrooms supported by related service professionals. What we want is a complex, integrated, interdisciplinary curriculum that meets the unique learning profiles of these individuals. We're focused on services and programs that address social, emotional, and behavioral needs. And our instruction needs to target their gifts and talents while simultaneously providing individualized special education supports. So I want to show you a student. This is a student that actually all three of us have worked with. Uh, we'll call this student C. And this is a student who would be considered um, 2E, or as having twice exceptionalities. She has gifts and talents in both math and music, and she has identified areas of disability in both congenital muscular dystrophy and ADHD. So what does this student look like? Uh, generally, when we're talking about 2E, they are diverse. They come from every socioeconomic, cultural, and ethnic background, and they are in almost all of our classrooms. The thing is, these students are at risk for not meeting their potential and for not having their specific learning needs met. And they're generally really under-identified because as educators, we tend to focus only on one aspect of their dual exceptionality. We either focus on their gifts and talents or we only focus on their disabilities. But what's important to remember is that these students have areas of giftedness and a disability. Now you can think of some probably famous examples of people like this, like Stephen Hawking, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Helen Keller, Ray Charles, Agatha Christie, who actually had dysgraphia, which is really kind of cool to think about for uh, a prolific writer like her, Temple Grandin, Robin Williams, Steven Spielberg. Uh, there are lots and lots of examples. So what we're talking about is a student who's been identified in each of these two areas. So in our gifted and talented areas, we've got creative thinking, leadership, general intellectual ability, psychomotor, specific academic ability, or visual and performing arts. Or on this side, we also have all of the different IDEA category um, labels. So autism, deafblindness, deafness, developmental delay, specific learning disability, those areas. 
So what this means for us as teachers when we have students who are labeled as twice exceptional is that we have to support both the giftedness and the area of disability. So for giftedness, where do we start? Well, we start by identifying their areas of giftedness and we look for content rich task demands and assessments. And we want to implement research based curriculum units. When we're talking about the areas of disability, we start with eligibility documentation and we look at their IEP, the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. Here we call it a PLAF. In some areas it's called a PLEP or a PLOP. Uh, but the IEP, we're also going to look for their specifically designed instruction or SDI and supplementary aids and services and SAS. And that's, those are research based and those are going to be found in the IEP document themselves. So let's look at some resources specifically for supporting these learners who are labeled as twice exceptional. We'll start with some technology supports. So what you see here is the Bloom's taxonomy with our um, remembering and understanding and applying and analyzing and evaluation and creating. And what I have um, found for you is this document. Actually, I did not create this, uh, but found this document for you that shows these different uh, Google Suite areas that can address um, different Google Suite apps that can address these area areas for you on Bloom's taxonomy. So I'll include a link to this for you to use later if you want to try that later. But one of the places I really like to start is EdTech Teacher. Now this is a website that you can go to and it helps us as teachers find apps that are based on what we want students to do. This can be really helpful when we are considering how to extend or differentiate our products like providing some scaffolding. So you go to this app and tool guide and when you click on the slide links this is a hyperlink. It'll take you directly to this page and then you first start with choosing are you looking for a learning activity? Do you want to do you want to search by what device or do you want to search by their grade level? And then you can filter. So we, we've got here we can click on this drop down menu and pick what we're doing. So for instance, I want my students to read and consume the content and they have Chromebooks and we're looking at that five through eight grade level. So you click those and then you will get this list. This search engine will pop up with like here, Google Play Books and Kindle Cloud Reader. Now what I would like to point out here is that with these, it combines with the Google Chrome extension. So if you're using Google Classroom, this is already going to be something that you can add. Um, but you can combine it with the extension for read and write and select and speak. Most books, when you use this, can then become an audiobook, even if it's not a specifically designed audiobook. And it's the same for the Kindle Cloud Reader. So it's possible to read Kindle books purchased directly from Amazon. Uh, you can go through Whispercast, uh, or you can install the Send to Kindle app, and that way it'll go directly to their Kindle Cloud Reader. So this is a, a, um, a hyperlinked document that I want you all to have, and this is by Barbara Westford. And what she has done is, is looked at the universal design for learning framework. So the essence of UDL, we know, lies in these three main principles, multiple means of representation, opportunities for multiple means of expression, and multiple means of engagement. So she calls this a placemat, and this is this placemat of core apps serving learning for all. So you've got all of these different apps. Now when you click on this link, each one of those thumbnails is a hyperlink and it's going to take you to that particular app. So for instance, if we want to take a closer look, uh, we've got a section labeled here, including students with learning disabilities with reading disabilities, and then she's got a link of all these different apps that would be good for those students. This lower level, including students with executive functioning disabilities. So any of those that you click is going to take you to where you need to go to try it out. The next thing I want to show you is text to speech and speech to text using read write. Now this image that you're seeing, this is from uh, the Chrome extension that you can use. Um, and, and this is one that we have used with a student, uh, particularly one of Michael's students who is who shows gifts and talents in math specifically. So he's listed there, but also has a specific learning disability in reading and also has ADHD. And so this student would be labeled as twice exceptional. And what he used this for was he used the text to speech. Now there's different read, write is fine. You can use dragon naturally speaking. You can use Kurzweil, um, all of those different things. But, but what it does is it allows when we put text for it to read aloud. So he would just put in headphones. No one necessarily had to know that he was having it read. He just used his headphones. He had his Chromebook uh, and he was listening to the text as it was being read to him. 
know, one of the areas that tends to or has been at least in our experience a struggle for students who would be labeled as twice exceptional comes to writing or storytelling. Um, and so we want to show you some apps that allow for both support and extension for students with gifts and talents who also have a specific learning disability in reading like dyslexia uh, or in writing like dysgraphia. So what this allows is, it, is the students are able to benefit from some specific scaffolding that these apps provide and also it is really just super fun to use. So you don't have to just use it with these students, you could use it with your whole class, but apps like Vokey and uh, graphics allow you to create these um, talking heads that uh, to tell the stories or use the voices for you. You can have uh, different classroom backgrounds, you can create whole scenes or even comic books, and so students, students have seemed to really enjoy that. One that I particularly like for students is Powtoons. Uh, there's actually two of these cartoon apps that I like that I want to talk to you about, uh, but Powtoons is it's pretty easy for students to use. You do a lot of dragging and dropping uh, to create characters. There are characters that are already created and then you can personalize them somewhat, um, but it uses either a pre-recorded, like the students can pre-record a file of them talking, or they can use additional text, I mean, or additional uh, recordings, however they want to use it. They can have that audio background support and then the visual image support. The one that I personally use in my own classroom and in my teaching is Vyond, um, and it's very similar to Powtoons. It's a little bit more expensive. Uh, I think that the subscription for the for the essential, which is the, like the lowest level, is right around $300 a year. But what it does is it allows, again, also the same kinds of things. Uh, it just has a lot more, uh, it, you know, you tell the story, you have the writing or the, uh, the images, and you have music, you have sound. Um, but it allows for, in my opinion, a little bit more personalization. This example comes from a student who uh, is very bright, very high IQ, but struggles specifically with pragmatic language and expressive language and reading emotion. So some of those characteristics that we see on student with students um, who are on the autism spectrum, uh, understanding other people's experiences, understanding their perspectives, expressing the student's own emotions, even identifying. And this particular student also has significant anxiety and a history of early trauma in her early life experiences. Uh, and so with this, with this app, what she was able to do uh, was tell this story they had been reading, or a young girl in the Holocaust, Number of the Stars, and she was writing this poem. They had to write a poem about this experience. And so, um, actually, I'll show it to you here. She was just a young girl with her friends. When they got home one day, they thought their lives were going to end. Nazis in every direction. Citizens had no proper protection. A Nazi came knocking on a door of a Jew and asked who they knew. One night when there was a full moon, Two families were working on a plan to escape real soon. A young redhead man came to help them escape. He told them how to avoid on getting caught all along the way. Yeah. Nazis going door to door, their weapons made them look like Thor. All were afraid of these terrible men who killed a lot of people, and one of them was a redhead. A little girl named Anne Marie, wondering where her friend Ellen could be. All the way across the sea, Ellen said, where's Anne Marie? Hitler hated all the Jews, and there was nothing anyone could do. So that's an example of the student. And this was a seventh grader. Uh, again, 130 IQ, but very few pragmatic language skills, unable to identify. But what I loved about her work with this particular app was that if you look, as you watch the video, you can see all of these facial expressions, and those have to be created separately using the app. So, so she created facial expressions that demonstrated the emotions that this child that this girl in the story was feeling. Uh, and honestly, prior to that, none of her teachers really thought she understood those kinds of things because she just didn't demonstrate them. And she didn't exhibit that, that kind of awareness before. Just kind of a neat thing, but Powtoons works very similarly. So does Animoto. You can do some different things. The other thing uh, that is really helpful 
helpful for students is using programs like EduCreation. So that you need to use specifically with an iPad uh, or a tablet, a touch screen. But what it allows you to do is um, you can drop images or create videos and then you can screencast over top of it, which is which you can do with the Chromebook, but then you can write on it. So you can use your stylus or your finger and write on it. So I can I can link these examples for you later. Uh, but what it allows us to do for, for two different areas in our twice exceptional is one, we can really scaffold and provide some remediation or intensity for students that, you know, we were introducing new content or we're introducing something new and they need to really have it hurt. They need to hear it over and over again. They need to have an opportunity to get some really in-depth, intense discussion or explanation of it. But also our students who our students can create these as well. They're very user friendly, very easy. And EduCreations has um, has a free version for for students. Uh, there are some subscriptions, but the free version is actually really really easy to use. And you have the features. It just doesn't let you save as many of them on the site itself. Um, Poplet. There's a free version, Poplet Lite, that is totally fine for most students, but it allows students to create these maps, uh, whether we're doing story maps or we're doing graphic organizers of some kind. Uh, it allows not the students to create them so they can really extend, expand and extend. You know, they can add links, they can add video links, hyperlinks to other documents, they can put images, they can really, really go deep into whatever it is that they are working on. But we can also use them to provide scaffolding for students where we can and we can go ahead and link, uh, you know, word banks or images or definitions or anything that we need to for our students. Apps like Read, Write, and Think also have some different options for creating things like Venn diagrams and even some games for, for students um, just to get that additional scaffolding. If you haven't already done some flipped classroom activities, flipping the classroom, at least for some instructional components, can be really helpful for this particular group of students because we can flip an assignment or even an entire unit which allows opportunities for us to go deeper with the students or for them to extend or us to extend when we're working one-on-one -on -one with them in the class or we can use that one-on-one -on -one time to scaffold and provide support through repeated practice or repeating instructions or things like that. Edpuzzle is another one that we can use as both teachers or have our students create. Edpuzzle works with Google Classroom and it's an extension on Chrome. Uh, you can take YouTube videos and drop them in and then you can create uh, quiz questions or understanding questions or process questions um, to, to put in the video at different points. So it pauses the video, asks the questions, uh, and students get that opportunity to to uh, refresh or review or study the material. Uh, you can, all kinds of questions, they can have to write their own answers or they can have selected ones. Um, that is a really helpful one. I want us to look a little bit about some extension and support that we can use with G Suite or Google Suite. Uh, they really, Google has has a ton of supports that we can use. And since many of us are using Google Classroom, that can be super helpful. So one of the first things I mentioned before, uh, text-to-speech, there's a ton of apps, but actually you can just use the voice typing feature in Google Docs for Google Docs, Google Slides, um, you know, whatever you're working on. You just go up to the top and you click Tools and then you go down to Voice Typing. This is super helpful because it reduces spelling errors for students. It encourages thought development and it can help our students not wear out. We've got a lot of students who will write less or choose less complex words or sentences because the typing is exhausting or challenging or they can think some really great thoughts but they just can't get it to paper. So students who have gifts and talents in creative writing um, and in thinking and in processing but they also have a disability uh, in reading or writing or executive function using voice typing in Google Docs or Google Slides can be super, super helpful for those students. The other thing when we're in a Google Doc, I want to show you this Explore tool. So we also have students who um, maybe they're excited about their topic and then they click on, they need to search for something on the internet, then they just go down the rabbit hole um, and they get lost in the internet and then they've lost their, they've lost their class and time to work. So this Explore tool um, allows you to search the web or your own Google Drive um, right while you're in your doc. The thing that's helpful, uh, because we're always trying to teach our students how to do kind of this writing and publishing, is that if you click these three dots next to web results, it'll ask you what format you're using for your citations, MLA, APA, or Chicago. You can click that, and then when you click it, if they have found a link like that we're using here, you'll see these two little quotation marks. 
if you click on the quotation mark, it will insert the correct citation as a footnote at the bottom of the page. So we can start working on that early for them. So here's what it looks like. Uh, it is a footnote, but they could copy and paste it and put it on a reference page. So the, the last thing I want to introduce to you is this action plan template for supporting students who've been identified as twice exceptional. So uh, this is a template that, uh, that Laura and I have created and that we've used uh, with Michael and his students and some other students where we go ahead and have an action plan. Of course, students who are identified as twice exceptional already have an IEP, um, but it may be helpful. You can see on the left, we've got our areas of disability and we put the IDA category there. We want to list what specific SDI, that's our specially designed instruction, or SAS, which is our supplementary aids and services, are required for the student as a result of their disability and then we want to look at what's our area of giftedness or talented, uh, and then what specific specially designed instruction can we use to address this. So if we're compacting, we want to say that we're compacting. If we're, you know, whatever it is that we're doing, we want, we want to put that in there. So we might say, here's our, here's our SDI. You can see on this left-hand side, here's our SDI. Uh, these are the best ways to help a student with a disability reach a goal. So we'll enter it uh, there, and then on the right-hand side, what are the curricular supports or enrichment strategies that we can use based on this area? So if you've got a student who's got more than one area, maybe they have math and then they also have music or, you know, we can, we can put those in. And then we can look at technology support. So technology is wonderful for allowing our students with gifts and talents to extend because they can do wonderfully creative things and they can create podcasts and videos and all kinds of stuff. But it's also the great uh, leveler, the great equalizer for students with disabilities because they can get those ideas out, uh, they can express themselves in ways that they previously weren't able to do with just pencil and paper. So what are the technology supports that are needed? We put that in there. Then if we have any ideas regarding IDEA eligibility or curriculum access, like how do we do this in the general classroom, we can put those notes there so that we can talk to our colleagues about that. Same thing for gifted and talented eligibility and curricular access. So what, what are we doing or what do we need to do for these students? And then any action steps that need to happen. Do we need to meet with the teachers? Do we need to put uh, accommodations in place? Um, do, do we need to um, you know, move to a different classroom, do some grouping, whatever it is, we can have this all on one document that then we can share with that student when they go from one year to the next year. And then a couple links I want to show you all. Uh, Rights Law has some additional articles and some resources specifically. Uh, we've been teaching in Kentucky, uh, so the Kentucky Department of Education has a ton of resources and supports for both students with gifts and talents and who have disabilities. Uh, we highly recommend using the Lesson Plan Handbook and the IEP Guidance Document because it offers very specific SDI and SAS for the different areas of disability, uh, as well as explaining what the different components of the IEPR, the Council for Exceptional Children. You can click on that link and it clearly defines disability and also exceptionalities. We have a, a gifted and talented SIG uh, in CEC. And then the 2E newsletter has some really good suggestions for how do we implement supports and how do we involve families. So uh, thank you so much. It's been super exciting to be a part of this conference. And so I want to give you uh, my email and Laura's email. And, um, and if you have questions, I would love what well, can answer them for you today, but you can also send an email later.